peace. Let's center ourselves on worshiping him. Let's do it, guys. Good morning. We are incredibly glad to have all of you here. Everybody here on live stream, we're glad to have you guys too. So thank you guys for being a part of it, guys. And you know what? We have been promising you the last few weeks that there's a ton of stuff coming up, and now we are seeing exactly that because, oh, man, are gosh. we getting busy. You know, May is a busy birthday month in our family, but you've, like, doubled everything I'm going to have to do. Yeah, well, there thank you go. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Let me tell you guys, we got a lot of stuff, so we're going to hit you with a bunch of stuff. But when we're done, just go to our website, go to Facebook, and you can see what this is looking out, uh, what's coming up. But a couple things you need to be aware of. First of all, one of them is right away. And I've been talking for the last several weeks that Mother's Day, by the way, guys, don't forget this. Mother's Day is next Sunday. And we're going to be doing a slideshow with pictures of some of the moms and uh, kids in our congregation. And if you would like to be a part of that, we would love a picture of if, if you and your mom, uh, or if you're a mom, you and your kids, grandkids, whatever. You can do that, but we need those by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, because that's when we got to get the show together. So you can either email those to us, or if you'd like, you can just, if you don't have that capability, just come on by, drop them off for just a second. We can scan them quick for you, but we need those by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, okay? And then coming up, oh my gosh, the 23rd of May. The 23rd of May, of May so that's weeks. three weeks from today. This is a major day, but there's something you need to do today for this. Uh, it's Pentecost. Yeah, I didn't expect a cheer, all right? Because <laughs> let's be hey. honest, we don't think Pentecost okay, as this. Let's all sing the Pentecost song. Right, exactly, yes. I <laughs> wow. don't have a Pentecost a song. song. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was good, guys. <laughs> See, You've this been working is why, on that, right, John? This is why I tell people some pastors have a staff, I have a terrorist cell. But anyway, guys, but what Pentecost is, it's all about taking church outside of church. Taking what we do here and taking it out there into the streets. So we're going to be doing exactly that, and we're going to have a couple of ways that you can do that. We have this wonderful, incredible, crazy, nutty idea. We want to put 10 teams of three or four people out into the street, and we're going to give you an address of somebody who is just unable to take care of their yard, uh, either being elderly so we're or not really, physical. We're not in, really in the street. We're in the yard. We're in the yard. Yeah, we're okay. taking to the yards. We're not going to do any paving. or. Anything. Yes. So you can sign up today at the Welcome Center. If you'd be willing to give us three hours of your time, and it's going to be light yard work. We're talking about planting flowers or mowing or you know something that, that a lot of us can do and some of us enjoy doing. And you can sign up today, and we're gonna, you can be Christ's love for somebody who needs it, okay? In addition to that, we do need uh, yards to do. So if you know somebody who's struggling to take care of their yard, let us know that too. We would love to have you be a part of that. And, and, and if you can't do the physical labor, but you want to like still be part of it, you can donate you know, a flat of flowers yeah, or um, something exactly. like that, a, a pot to put them in. And then afternoon, that afternoon on the 23rd, guys, 
from 11 a.m. until 8 p.m. I know this is suffering for Jesus, but we need you to eat ice cream, okay? <sighs> we talk a lot about our veterans, and there are over 3 million disabled veterans in the United States. And so right now, we, we take that real, real seriously. In, in August, our Vet Rock uh, concert's gonna be for the Disabled Veterans of America of Indiana. But we're not waiting that long. On that date, okay, the 23rd in three weeks, Culver's has made us this incredibly, well, no pun intended, sweet deal. They've gone way out of their way for us. From 11 until three, or until eight, rather, you can come in, dine in, drive through, take out, or whatever, but if you say, this is for First Methodist, and this is for uh, the program for veterans. They're going to give us 20%. And of that 20%, 100% is going to go towards helping veterans, guys. So we need to be able to really, really support that. So tell people and be a part of that. That's really, really cool. So you could have lunch. You could have a mid-afternoon snack after you've done work in somebody's yard. There you go. And you can have dinner. Yes. Yeah, it's, I got my day planned. Yeah, and then dessert. <laughs> and then dessert. You can have a Sunday so, on yes, Sunday. Exactly. Okay. Anyway, guys, also coming up in May, sign-ups are in May. It's going to start in June. Is a great project called Run, Walk, Run Slash Walk for God. And this was a real hit last year. Oh, it was. Uh, uh, Barb um, Hamner and, and our a, a Paul people, Sills yeah. uh, kind of facilitated the, the class. Yeah. And, yeah, they had a lot of fun. I took pictures. And, and, and I'm going to be doing this this year, guys. So if I can do this, so can you. It is for those of us who may be, how do you put this, maybe exercise deficient and for everybody else. But for those, and the goal is to, it's a spiritual group. It's a Christian group. There's discipleship there, but the goal is to be able to walk or run a 5K at the end of that. So, guys, you can sign up, look for that as well. Yes, and on May 30th, we have our Indy 500 potluck. Now, we're going to be in the hall, and the race is going to be on those big TV screens, but if you're like me, you're not there to watch the race. So what else are you going to do? We have a couple of really fun things. We'll have crafts for kids to do. We'll have board games out and cards. So if you just want to sit and visit with somebody and play a game, you can do that. But also, because coming up in June is our family movie night out on the front lawn, we're bringing in giant boxes that uh, we've been collecting from Sam's. We get some of our yep. shipments from Sam's. Have your kids make a car that they can use for family movie night. It'll be That's like a great. little cardboard drive-in. It's going to be a great <laughs> night, guys. There's also a rummage sale coming up for... Uh, uh, for Buddy Bags at June 10th and 11th. That's uh, the week of the uh, citywide garage sale. And you know, garage sale, yard sale, rummage sale. Can't they come up with one name? <laughs> anyway, uh, June 10th and 11th, that Thursday and Friday, we're participating down at uh, the warehouse at 550 East Burrell Drive. And uh, we are taking donations, but not clothes. We are up to our eyebrows and clothes, which I know my eyebrows aren't that high up, but it's still a lot of clothes. <laughs> you got there before I did. I know. I so, know. guys, you know what? We've been, we've been, t you just hit you with a lot of stuff, and there's a lot more coming up that you need to be aware of. Do me a favor. You can go to our website. You can go to our Facebook. But, guys, this is an exciting time, and, and we are back, baby. We are back, and we are serving and kicking it in for Jesus Christ. I said something last week that I'm still sticking by. We're lungs, guys. That's what we are. We come here on Sunday mornings in order to breathe in love and peace and joy and victory. And, but the point is to go out there and exhale that stuff into the community, into our world. And it's through what you, you and Christ are doing that we are doing some serious damage in the cause of Jesus Christ in this world. So thank you guys for that. Do me a favor, would you, this morning, stand up, turn around, wave at somebody, greet them in the name of the Lord. Wave at the camera, guys.
seated. Welcome back, Cheryl. Oh, man. We are the feet. We are the hope. We are the victory of Christ lived out in the real world. And we thank God for the privilege of being exactly that. Guys, I have told you guys this before. There are tons of other places you could be worshiped. And a lot of them would need you a lot less than we need you. But it's the cause of Christ that calls us on. I want to say thank you for your support, for your prayers, for your patience with us, for your, for your time and your energy, and yeah, your tithes and your gifts, guys. That means a lot, especially right now. And you can, even though we're not passing the collection plate, you can certainly continue to give either online or by text giving or by mailing in, dropping it off in the boxes, however you do it, guys. This is not obligation, it's not dues. It's the privilege of living out his life in Christ. Your prayers are also so much a part of that. They really, really are. And a couple names I want to hold up to you guys. Uh, we've been praying for Tom Lauer for a while as he's been dealing with a tumor in his leg. And uh, the biopsy in that actually came back better than what they suspected. But now he has a staph infection in that leg. So please, let's be praying for him. And for Lori Kelly of our congregation, 
who is in community hospital. She's been dealing with uh, cancer treatment, but also uh, COVID. And the good news is she's in a good place where they're going to take care of her. And uh, please, let's be praying for, for our dear friend Lori. Uh, Jerry Nybert, Jerry is back there. You, you, wherever you are, Jerry, amaze me. Yeah, Jerry got a stint, had a heart procedure, and got a stint this week. And here he is, so thank you. And we love you, Jerry. We're praying for you. We're praying for you, buddy. Um, let me see, Pat Schultz. Uh, our prayers are for our family member, Pat Schultz, on the passing of her mom. And uh, our prayers uh, go out to her and to her family. And man, in the midst of this, it's great to get some good news because for the last, I don't know, month, six weeks, we've been praying for Rob Bell as he's been recovering from surgery. All I got to say is, Rob, welcome home. We are so glad to have you, and we love you, buddy. Welcome back. And also, I would ask for prayers for one of our heroes, uh, a really important hero to a uh, dear friend of the church, but also here to our community. Dave Crane is the uh, chief, uh, the fire chief here in town. And a few weeks, or a couple months ago, he got a kidney transplant and then developed an infection, an incisional infection afterwards. And so please, let's be praying for Dave, one of the most selfless, dedicated public servants I've ever known. So please, let's be praying for him. Guys, uh, what do we got coming in on live stream? We, we need the mic open. I'm sorry. Prayers for George K., who has a close friend who re recently lost her grandson. Okay. And, and that's it. And that's it. All right. So what's going on in your guy lives, guys? Yeah. Yeah. What's going on? I, I, I apologize. Okay. Your friend Brittany is going to start chemo. And our prayers are with her and with you. Yes. Good. We were praying for your niece, and she's doing okay. Very good. Other things going on? Yes, Andy. Ah. Oh. Absolutely. For your aunt's family, she passed on into God's glory after a good long life. Very good. Yes, Rob. That's great. Well, we love you. We're glad to have you back, buddy. Anything else? In that case, Cheryl Lucas is back. The proverbial bad penny. But anyway, Cheryl is back, and we're glad. As is Barb, we're glad to have both of you guys. We love you. All right, guys, let's be together in God's presence. Let's pray. Almighty Oh, merciful Heavenly Father, awesome God, who is bigger than our greatest joy and our greatest sorrow, who is more wonderful and powerful than our deepest fear and everything else that life can hand us. Dad, we come into your presence and we open up our lives and outspills all the stuff that makes up our lives. The joys and the hurts, and the gratitude and the fears, our need for forgiveness where we have failed, Lord, all of that stuff we just lay into your lap knowing that you are a God who's big enough and strong enough and wonderful enough to be able to meet all of those needs. Lords, we give you our needs and the needs of the people we love and all your people, Lord. We give you those who are hurting, whether it be physically or emotionally or spiritually, for those who are living in uncertainty and fear, for all those who are grieving and missing somebody they love, Lord, be there to fill in the gaps in their lives. Let your healing be there and your strength be there and your love be there. And if it be your will, equip us, Lord, to be there 
as your hands and your feet and your voice kick us right out of our comfort zone, Lord, and into the lives of people who need you. Lord, we give you our community and our nation, and we thank you. We thank you for the goodness that still runs through this land. In the midst of controversies and stuff we don't agree about and all of that, Lord, underneath and between and through all of that, your goodness is still there. So give us hearts to be able to embrace one another. Whether or not we always agree. Lord, we thank you for our heroes, our first responders, our health care workers, our all of those who are standing in the gap right now and the toll it takes on them. You give them your strength and your refreshment, Lord. Be with them. Lord, we give you our, our, those in leadership over us. Your word says to pray with them, pray for them. And whether or not we agree with them, we ask for your wisdom and your strength for everybody, both sides of the aisle, the ones we agree with and the ones we don't, and give them your wisdom and your safekeeping and your strength. Lord, we give you your world and where your kids are scared or alone or hungry or thirsty or living in terrorism and war, we ask for your peace. In the midst of all of the ways that we have messed up your world, Lord, we pray for your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. All these things we ask you. And we ask, Lord, that you would bless us in the midst of that. We give you your bride, the church, all over the world. And we give you this incredibly special place. Lord, use us to be able to build your kingdom in the lives of your people. Lord, let us be those lungs that breathe out your life and hope in the middle of all of the messiness of life. Now in the quietness of this moment, we lift up to your own individual needs. Hear us, we pray. All of these things we ask you. In the name of the victorious one, our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who, when we ask, taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Don't you hate going to the concert where they say, and here's some of the, here's some of the new stuff, right? You know, you always want to hear the greatest hits. And this scripture is becoming very quickly the greatest hits for us as a people. Scripture that may sound just a little bit familiar. From Matthew, the 28th chapter. Now after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the sepulcher, the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, for fear of this angel, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Don't be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He isn't here. He is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where he lay. This is the word of our Lord. Let's pray for just a second. Heavenly Father, in the next few minutes... Just clear away the clutter and all of the stuff that's in our head. and Let us bask in the love that you have for us. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. One more time, good morning, everybody. We're uh, in, in now the, the uh, let me see, the fourth part of this sermon series called 
love wins, where we're asking the question, Easter, so what? And if you, you know, I know this is a few of your first time back, and you're sitting there, you're saying, wait a minute, isn't that the Easter scripture? Yeah, we saved it for you guys, okay? We saved that for you guys just so when you come back. No, 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 no. The truth of the matter is, this sounds like it's old news. You know, we're a month out of Easter, and our human psychology is most of us are pretty good at working up to something, enjoying something, celebrating something, and then as soon as it's over, we put it in the rearview mirror, right? And Easter morning came and went, and by now you've put away the decorations. The chocolate bunnies have been eaten, probably for some of us. They didn't last that long. I hope for your sake all the Easter eggs have been uh, found by this point because if they haven't, when you do find them in August, it's not going to be pretty. I absolutely promise, okay? And all of that stuff is behind us, and yet we're still talking about it. And let's be honest, it feels a little bit like yesterday's news, right? Like, don't we have something else we can be talking about? Aren't there other things we should be pushing off to? But the question, is it really yesterday's news? As we draw towards the end of this series, because the thing of it is, Easter is not something we cram into an hour on uh, a Sunday morning once a year. Easter is not that great story that we turn the page and get packed. Easter is about hope. Easter is about victory. Easter is about life. And how can you put an expiration date on that? Because I don't know about you, but the way I go through my life, I could use hope any time of the year, you know? Victory, sign me up, especially on the Mondays and the Tuesdays and the Junes and Julys as we go through our year. Life, life when we're just struggling to get through and kind of exist and trying that, you know, our whole goal is not to mess up. Real life, that's something you can't contain just to a story about Easter. Maybe the real question is, why doesn't that reality of Easter shape every moment in our lives? Now, guys, let's be honest. That sounds like a real pastoral statement, right? You know, that sounds something the preacher guy says, you know. Kind of like when in January we say, why can't we have Christmas all year long? Why? Because by July you'd be sick of Frosty the Snowman. I promise you would, okay? It kind of sounds like we're saying, let's just continue this on. No, 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 no. If Easter is more than a story, but it is not it, but it's a reality. Check that. If it is the reality for us, then everything should change every moment of our lives. Why can't we keep on to that? Well, as a matter of fact, as we've been discussing the last few weeks, there's some reasons we don't hold on to that power of Easter. And one of them is fear. All right? Now, that sounds weird because we do not associate Easter with fear. That's Halloween, which is why I love it. But anyway, you know, you know, you don't think about fear and Easter. But the funny thing of it is, if you read the story, ironically enough, fear is written all over this story. This is the greatest story of joy and peace and victory and everything else. And yet the reality of it, fear is all over this. Who's the first person? Who's the first sandbag? Who's the first person to encounter Easter? It's the guard, right? It's the guard. And what it says is, the guard, uh, the stone rolls back, the guard sees what happens, and they became like dead men. The Wilkins Unauthorized Version translates that to, they wet themselves and passed out, okay? The, The first reaction to the greatest news in history is somebody is scared to death, and it doesn't stop there. Because then the women show up. And they encounter this angel, and the angel says, don't be afraid. Why would he say that if they weren't scared to death? And 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 the hits just keep on coming. And suddenly Jesus meets them, and he says, greetings. This is to the men who are coming. And And they took hold of him, and they worshiped him. Okay, so they're in this place of worship. They're in this place of awe. But he says, don't be afraid. Why? Because awe and worship and joy and fear are not mutually exclusive. They're scared to death, guys. And it keeps on coming. Because that night he shows up for the, to the apostles. Uh, and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, take it back. Jesus sends them out to the apostles. And it, says to, and it says, go tell the world I've risen. They tell nobody. Why? Because they're scared to death. That night Jesus shows up to the apostles. What's their reaction? Anybody want to take a guess? 
They're scared to death. It's literally all over this story. How weird is that? These guys are a part of the greatest victory march, the greatest victory pa- uh, party ever, and they're scared out of their wits. Well, when you think about that, is that really so surprising? I mean, if they encounter that really in the reality, not just read as a story, but if and they encounter that in the reality, then there is a reason why they're scared. For the one thing, life isn't supposed to work that way. Oh, I know there's God and there's power and all that kind of stuff. You know, that's right. That, God's over there in the corner. But I, I figured out the way life works, right? And I figured out pretty well what the way it's going to go, the way it's not going to go. But, uh, but now, all of a sudden, God is rewriting the rule book. Chuck Colson, in his great book, From Belief to Conviction, said, the fundamental we can, distinction we can make in life is, do we live in a natural world that operates by natural means, or do we live in a supernatural world where God most of the time operates by natural means? On Easter morning, they find out they're operating in a supernatural means, and God is rewriting the rule book. But that's the other thing. God isn't supposed to work that way. See, they, these disciples, these women, they're the, they're the same way as we. We got God figured out. I've been doing this God thing for a while. Do you have any ideas how many meetings I've gone through and how many bazaars I've run? You know, I've supported this church for the thick and thin all these years. I got God figured out, and I know what God's supposed to do and what God's not supposed to do, and this ain't it. Well, guess what? They're finding out that God has this amazing ability to act like God and to act how God's going to act and show up in the most unlikely places, like in a graveyard. And then there's the question besides, the really scary question, what if it's true? You ever think about that? Because the guys who are hearing this story, they're, they're hearing that Jesus is alive. This is great. These are the same guys who ran away from him when he needed them most. This is one of those guys who denied him three times when he needed him most. And it's one thing to look back at your actions and and feel bad and feel guilty, but if that same guy is now alive again, and if he's coming my way, let's be honest, I don't know what his mood's going to (laughs) be. Because he has a memory, and apparently he knows God, and they talk. What's it really going to be? Is he coming back in judgment? Is he coming back in anger? In truth, they had a lot to be scared about. If you look at them in their context, they were in situations where they had no confidence in their leaders. The leaders had messed up, the Pharisees and the temple authorities and the Romans. They had no, uh, their leaders had failed them. Not only that, but they had failed themselves. They didn't have to look very far in their rearview mirror to see the, way, see the ways they had messed up. And their situation was unsafe. And tomorrow looked really shaky. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Isn't this how we've lived the last year of our life? With the political turmoil and social turmoil and, and COVID and all the things in their lives. And it gets scary. As scary for us now as it probably was then, because in reality, fear is still very much a part of our lives. It's a part of our culture. We thrive off of fear. We broadcast it, right? We broadcast our fears. I've said this before. If you're not sure what to be scared of, don't worry. You can turn on CNN or Fox. Either one's more than happy to give you something to be scared to death about. We vote with it, and we try to motivate people to vote with it. We buy and sell with it. Interesting thing, in COVID, with the uncertainty of COVID, and we hear about all the businesses that are failing, you know what? Two businesses that have absolutely thrived, gun sales and home security systems, okay? And I'm not dissing on either of those, but what I'm saying is when we get scared, we search for anything, anything that feels safe. We, we, we live in our culture of fear. Whoop, there you go. And when fear is driving the bus, it focuses our emotions. When fear goes beyond fear of that particular thing, excuse me, and it starts controlling your life, it'll control your emotions, and all of a sudden, everything that wasn't scary looks 
scary. Fear will control your decisions. I'll bet you if you look back at your life, the worst decisions you've ever made were decisions made out of fear, right? Fear is a lousy advisor. It, fear will control your relationships, and it'll drain the joy out of those relationships. And it makes us desperate to control our world because fear will tell you it's all up to you. And with that comes the stress. When fear is driving the bus, it interprets everything in your world, everything in your world as scary. Real quick story. It was in the summer of after my first year in seminary. And uh, I was doing a summer internship for six weeks full time in this beautiful little church in Thomasville, North Carolina. I'd been there weekends during the year, and now I was there for six weeks. Loved the church, great people, but I was really missing Jane. I was missing my folks and my friends. When a buddy of mine from uh, one of my best friends, a guy who was later my, my best man, as a matter of fact, a guy named Tom uh, from college, wrote and he said, hey, I want to come down and spend three days with you. Can we do that? And I said, that's great. I really am lonely. would love to see you. But I said, i got to tell you, there's not a whole lot going on in Thomasville, North Carolina. don't know what we're going to do. He said, I remember in college we went, we went camping. Can we go camping? And I said, yeah, absolutely. As it happened, the church where I was at, I had always heard they owned this wooded lot way, way back, about 25 minutes away, deep North Carolina woods. It was never used, so I went to the senior pastor, and I said, hey, can my buddy and I go camping there overnight? He looked at me like I was nuts. I was used to that, Okay. He said, if you really want to, he says, it's really deep woods, but if you really want to, you can do that. He said, I'll, as a matter of fact, I'll lend you the tent, I'll lend you the camping equipment, but I got to tell you, it's really deep woods. I said, no, we can handle this. I said, how am I, we going to find our way out there, though? He said, well, Andy can show you the way. Now, Andy, real quick, was the church custodian. He was an older guy. He had been around there since God was a kid, okay? He knew everything about that church, everything about the community, and he was a very warm, friendly guy, except to outsiders and Yankees, which I was both. So I always kind of had the feeling that he had it in against me, okay? But I went to Andy, and he said, okay, if that's what you want to do. So that morning, Tom after, got there the night before. We met Andy at the church, and we drove about 20 minutes down, this, this, down to this sort of single-lane dirt road, and he pulls off on the shoulder right next to these big woods, and I got out, I said, is this it? He said, oh, no, this isn't it. He said, we got to walk about 15 minutes into those woods to get to the clearing. He said, can you handle that, Yankee? And I, and I looked at all the stuff we would brought. I said, I think so. So we loaded up everything that we had, right, carrying everything that we could. And I noticed that Andy didn't carry anything, but, carry anything, but he went to the back of his pickup truck, pulled out this huge coil of really thick rope. And I thought, you going to hang somebody back there? You know, is there something I need to know? And we hiked about 20 minutes into the woods until we got to this clearing, probably about a 30-foot round section with no trees, but the grass was about 8 inches tall. He said, here you go, good luck. So we dropped all of our stuff, and I turned around and I looked. Now here was the first thing that caught my attention. Because if you can picture this, there was kind of a hollow spot in the grass, like somebody had taken a single wheel and rolled it through the grass. I later wondered if that's what happened. But anyway, sort of a tunnel through the grass. And I looked, I said, Andy, has somebody been riding a dirt bike out here? He said, nope, that's a snake track. What don't you get, dig? Come on, there's something you don't dig, right? Okay, forgive me, I'm going to pick on you. We, Bill, my, my favorite Marine here, one of the bravest guys I know. There's something you don't like, right? You don't dig? Yeah. German shepherds. German shepherds. There you go. I don't dig snakes, okay? I just don't do snakes. So when Andy said that, I, I, he had my immediate reaction. And he said, but don't worry. I got a way to keep you safe. And he showed this, this rope. He said, this is an old trick. He said, you loop this around where you're going to be staying, and Mr. No-Legs, he won't crawl over a rope. I later found out that was a North Carolina myth. But anyway, and then he looked at us, he winked, he said, good luck, see you day after tomorrow, maybe. <laughs> and he was gone. And I looked at that rope, I thought, there is no way that can protect me from a snake, but we're trying it. So we made this big loop out of, this, uh, out of the rope, but there was a bunch left over, so we left it coiled next to the, next to the tent. And we... Got, went, went in and we got this, all this big stack of firewood, right? A big pile of firewood. And that night we had a fire, you know, and then it was time to turn in. As soon as we laid down our sleeping bags, Tom said, I got a problem. I said, what? He said, I forgot my pillow in the car. I said, here's the flashlight. Good luck. 
He said, you're not coming with? I said, here's the flashlight and the keys. Good luck. What I think happened is when Tom left, his flashlight shone directly onto the rope that looped our camp. Anybody want to guess what I think he saw? Because there was this huge cry, this inarticulate cry. Now later, Tom would try to redeem himself by saying, I was just doing that to mess with you. But I, that does not explain the fact that when I came out of the tent a second later, he was standing on the pile of wood, waving his pocket knife in the air, okay? That should have been funny, except for the fact that when I stepped out, I stepped my foot directly in that coil of rope, and I looked down, and I understood exactly what it was. I was wrapped around by a snake. I screamed. I probably screamed several things, but I'm not, I will confess the only one I'm going to say to you is snake. And I lunged forward, and that's when the rope held, and I fell flat on my face. Now, guys, here's the point I'm making with this. If you could somehow go back into my neurological process and that, at that moment and saw what my eyes were transmitting to my brain, it would read rope. But if you want to know what my brain was transmitting to my heart, it said snake. Because at that moment, fear was driving the bus. And when fear's the lens through which you're seeing your world, all of a sudden, everything looks scary. And then comes Easter. There comes Easter, and everything changes. Everything changes in that one moment when God rewrites the rules. Because Easter isn't just an event. It's way more than just a story or something to preach about for a month. Easter becomes the lens through which we see our lives and our world and gives us hope and confidence and peace. That means because of Easter, we'll never be scared of anything ever again, right? Wrong. Wrong, because the truth is there's still some scary stuff out there. And the truth of the matter is, while perfect love may cast out fear, most of us, if we're going to be honest, aren't operating on, on perfect love. So we're still going to be scared at moments, and if you are, that's okay. But it means in the midst of that, in the face of that, in the middle of that, we have a hope because of Easter, we have a confidence and assurance, and you got a peace right in the midst of all the scariest stuff that you can imagine. Seeing our lives through the lens of Easter doesn't mean there's nothing left to be concerned about. It's not burying your head in the sand and singing the sun will come out tomorrow. That's not it, guys. It means when you face the scary things of life, when life goes sideways on you and there are some things that are really scary in that moment, it means knowing that the one who is bigger than death itself is ultimately bigger than the sum total of the things that scare us. Maybe you're going to face some scary things in life. Maybe you're going to face some messy things in life. But in that moment, because of Easter, we know we have a God who is bigger than that. It means that in the midst of this broken, scary world, hope is driving the bus. Victory is driving the bus. Fear doesn't have to drive the bus. Because of Easter, we know that God is, driving, is still driving the bus of our world and our circumstances of our lives. Look, listen, guys. I, I, I know most of you. I don't know everything going on in your lives. I'm going to guess some of you are facing some real scary stuff. And, and it, would be, it would be foolish for me as your pastor to sit up here and say, don't be scared. Reality is, in your life, in my life, there are going to be moments when life gets scary. But that's where Easter comes. It says, you know what? In the midst of that, this God who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, the God who said, I got you in my crosshairs no matter what, that God says, I'm going to be there with you in the midst of anything life can hand you. Three weeks ago, we started this series, and I gave you something to say, and you can share this with me right now. In the midst of life, what do we say? He arose for me. And that is cool. That is great. And I hope that stuck with you. It stuck with me. 
That's great, but it's not enough. It's not enough. Because when your life gets scary, when my life gets scary, knowing that he arose from me, that's a good thing, but it's not the point. When life is scary, we need to know not only did he rise from me, but what? He's driving the bus. In the midst of that scariest thing that's in your heart right now, in the midst of all those what-ifs about tomorrows, in the midst of all the things that are scary or messy or whatever, we have the confidence because of Easter to say, maybe it's scary. And maybe I'm feeling that right now, but you know what? I know something so much more. Fear is not gonna, going to drive the bus of my life. Why? Why? Because he's driving the bus in the good things in life and in the bad things in life and in everything in between in life. He's driving the bus. And it was scary. It was scary. Because he was facing the darkest time that you could imagine. And the guys sitting around that table that night, they didn't get it, but they knew that something scary was up. And when he wanted to give them peace, when he wanted to give them the sense of what his love really meant, he didn't just preach him a sermon. Instead, that night at the table, he took the bread. And he said, when life is difficult, when life is uncertain, remember this. This is my body that I give for you. When the supper was over, he took the cup, and again he returned thanks. And he gave it to the people that he loved, and he said, you know what, when life is scary... You need to know this is my blood shed for you. Lord, in the midst of messy lives, we come to you. And in the midst of all of the fears, we claim that love, and we ask that you would inhabit this sacrifice. It's just bread. It's just juice. It's all it is. But because your love is real, it becomes your body and your blood. Lord, take these and take us. Inhabit this gift and inhabit us in the midst of this gift. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. All are invited to come forward. And come forward exactly as you are. Joyous or scared, uncertain, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Come and share in the peace. Come and share in the life. Let's share it. be scared. Everyone come and share.
now you go out there into your week. I hope it's a great week for you. But it might get just a little bit scary somewhere along the line, but that's okay. Because in the midst of the fear and the messiness of life, He's driving the bus. And nothing can take that away. In the name of Christ, guys, let's go live it. Amen.